in the bottom tail of the learning distribution um, and more likely to be struggling quite a lot more. And some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, data we're going to present today speaks to sort of their experience and teacher interaction. What we also is important to understand that if we're serious about equity and inclusion and achieving learning for all, uh, then we will have to pay attention to improving learning for those who are from the most marginalized backgrounds, those who are struggling the most for whom the learning levels are the lowest despite being um, in school. Um, and the quality of teaching or teacher, uh, te teacher practice is perhaps the most significant factor in influencing learning outcomes, but also it's the most important lever, uh, policy lever that you have that, uh, that you can move to, uh, to help improve uh, learning outcomes. But there's a gap in our knowledge of what teacher practices look like. Even though a lot of progress has been made, now there's uh, data being collected on classroom practice in Punjab at scale, and this is the World Bank's uh, sort of intervention. It's uh, the, the pro project is named exactly the same as the one that I'm presenting for today. Today, but this is different. So the data that I'm presenting, and I'll talk a little bit about that, is different from um, the policy uh, administrative data that has been collected in all government schools at scale. Um, and what we're seeing is one of the concerns is that we need to know more about teaching practice, but we also need to understand more certain intangible factors that are very important for how teachers teach and whether or not you can sort of shift their teaching practices in a way that you can improve learning for everybody. And some of those are around their beliefs. Uh, so teachers' beliefs and teachers' attitudes, particularly at the time where the social distance between the children who are sitting in classrooms and the teachers themselves may be widening is very important to try to understand. And because these are intangible uh, factors that are less easy to measure, um, uh, it, it, it's more effort and more time needs to be spent thinking about uh, framing them, developing frameworks around them, but also noting how we can collect data on, on these uh, matters. So the guiding questions, so this is the context for the study and some of the, sort of the larger uh, uh, issues that were motivating us, but the guiding questions for the study that I'm going to present findings from today were around just discovering and documenting what the prevalent teaching practices in government classrooms were, um, and how these vary in relation to different groups of children, uh, what do we know about the interaction between whom we identify as marginalized children or children who may be struggling, and teachers, and what are teachers' beliefs about students, particularly those from marginalized backgrounds, and specifically about their capacities to learn? Um, and then what is the implication for learning of disadvantaged students? So as I mentioned, all the data that I'm going to be presenting today is from a project that was uh, led by a consortium of organizations. It was implemented in India and Pakistan at the same time. And our partners were uh, the Real Center at the University of Cambridge and poured in India. Um, and uh, this study uh, was uh, in Pakistan. This was in three districts in Punjab, uh, 50 schools we surveyed, uh, and six schools we went into for more in-depth sort of interviews and classroom observations. So just to give you a snapshot of the type of data we had, so on teaching practices, we used a narrative-based observation rubric. Uh, what I mean by that is this was a qualitative observation form. So it had open-ended sections, while the sections were very structured about the kinds of things that the observers had to uh, note, uh, uh, but uh, the data that they were collecting was in narrative form, um, which allowed, so right from the beginning of the class to the end of the class, uh, you had like sort of a description of every Everything that happened. And we had two observers uh, sit in each classroom and they observed multiple, uh, uh, the same teacher at least twice, if not three times. Um, and also uh, uh, one, of the, one of the observers was focused on the teacher and the other observer was focused on the students. Um, so with the teachers, we uh, supplemented the observ observation data with question on practice during interviews. So we spoke to them um, in between the observations of classrooms uh, that happened. 
happen. So similarly on student experience, we had identified four students prior to going in because we had student learning data. This was a sample based study. Uh, we had tested students as well. We had tested teachers on content knowledge as well. And because we had information about students, we were able to identify the four that we were interested in observing. And these two of them were at the top of the learning curve. So very high learning outcomes. Uh, two were at the bottom of the learning curve. So quite poor learning outcomes. Um, and at least one child uh, that our data showed had some, uh, some metric of disability had been identified for them uh, and were sitting in mainstream classrooms. We observed them as well. Uh, we also collected information on teachers' beliefs and attitude. This was both collected through the interviews as well as from the surveys. Um, just to give you a sense of who our sample were, so we were in Kasur, Sargota, and Hafizabad. Uh, these were uh, uh, the six schools that we spent a lot of time in. The qualitative uh, study was in six schools in these three districts. We have a mixture of teachers. So some of the old guard with who only had 10 years of experience and not didn't necessarily have a teacher certification were present there as well. But we had some who were very, very young recruits and very new recruits. Um, so so this kind of variation is important and we begin to see, even though I'm not covering that in my uh, presentation today, but we do see a variation in our data between uh, the attitudes and beliefs and uh, uh, some of the notions, the pedagogy, uh, which uh, young teachers express versus what some of the old guard expresses. So I think uh, that's also an important area to think about, but that variation isn't necessarily covered today. Um, the children that we had in our sample, as you might expect, there were more kids in government schools. Uh, so if you were from a low socioeconomic background, the higher proportion was in government schools. And if you were from a, a higher socioeconomic background, uh, this is from household survey that we conducted in the same communities, you were more likely to be going to a private school. Um, so just to talk, begin to now talk about some of the findings, what we found about teaching practices in government schools, and this is based on uh, uh, 64 classroom observations, is that the predominant method was teacher-directed uh, sort of instruction with quite little interaction with students. Again, this is around 2015-16 that we're going into um, uh, these classrooms, so it's a little bit dated. Uh, but this is what we found at the time, and we're finding a lot of resonance with other literature that's coming out from South Asia as well. Um, uh, but it'd be quite interesting to look at what the new data on classroom observations is now showing. Um, that comparison has not yet been done. But the teacher directed instruction in our 64 classroom observations was quoted over 300 times, more than any other strategy that we saw. This is not to say that there weren't other strategies that we noted teachers were uh, employing. So there was quite a lot of of incidents, quite numerous incidents also of individualized attention and monitoring. And what this means was the teachers were calling on individual students, they were walking around the room also, if classroom tasks were given, specific students they were approaching and helping as well um, during class exercises. Uh, there's also a lot of incidences of group work. Uh, which is to say students seated in small groups, directed sometimes uh, by the teacher, but sometimes the teacher also allowed these groups to be led by other students. Um, and you see this in uh, one of the excerpts from the classroom observation uh, for a fourth grade uh, boys school uh, is that the teacher says that uh, some, some students easily understand what needs to be done and others don't understand what needs to be done. So somehow it's better to allow them to interact. And the teacher expresses uh, that sometimes it's better for students to learn from each other and they can teach each other um, more than what the teacher can teach the students. So you get some sense that uh, there is a bit of a shifting of responsibility uh, to students who are doing better to communicate some of the work to other, uh, uh, to other students. Um, but this is not necessarily a practice that's only sort of um, uh, unique to Pakistan. Uh, this happens in, uh, we've noted that this happens in many other developing country contexts as well, um, but this has really come out. So while group work, some of it was directed by teachers, others was self-directed, expected to be, and some of the, just say, both monitors or some of the better students are then tasked with also explaining classwork to other students. We also noted that teachers were adapting their pace 
of teaching. So, so uh, uh, what I should, what this heading should say is they were adapting to the pace of learning. So they were adapting their uh, pace of teaching. So you had teachers talk about explicit strategies uh, where they were saying that they could use curriculum materials or syllabi materials from previous grades to teach uh, these uh, students. They could also have fewer, they, they, they also changed the number of tasks that these students were completing. So if they felt that a student was struggling they would slow the pace of teaching down for, for some of them. Um, they also expressed an understanding that unless more time was spent on some of these foundational uh, uh, sort of concepts, it would become difficult for some students to then progress and uh, uh, accept and um, operationalize some of the more advanced concepts, uh, learn them and apply them. Uh, so, so what we're learning is quite a nuanced sort of sense of how of learning paces and how uh, some students may be struggling more than others um, uh, that teachers did have and did express and teachers who are actively also in these schools uh, sort of uh, implementing these strategies on their own as well. There was a small minority of teachers who spoke in their interviews about providing support to children with disabilities. And one of the most important strategies or the most frequently mentioned strategies is that we ask such children to come and sit near us. Now, seating arrangements has emerged even in general as an important sort of strategy. So given that some of these classrooms are quite large, they tend to also be quite overcrowded. Uh, what teachers tend to do quite often, um, now here we're not talking about what they should do, we're talking about what they do do, um, is that they ask these students to come and sit next to them because that allows them to pay attention. But some of our observations show later on, uh, you'll get to see that despite, despite some of these strategies, which may have been in place uh, off and on, um, uh, and in, in, you know, with teachers own initiative in some places, rather than necessarily a systematic input that's going into, uh, that's going into teaching teachers guides for everybody uh, in some places while this is making a difference for children with disabilities because the interactions between teachers and those who are seated at the front of the class is uh, more frequent and the teacher is able to pay more attention their children were still falling through the cracks and I'll, I'll just talk about that uh, a little bit so most teachers expressed considerable doubts about whether children with disabilities who are sitting in these classrooms um, will be able to learn or not. So despite that they felt that it was important that these students are in class, uh, because it's important that they'll, they'll be able to complete their schooling and have some sort of degree to be able to say that, yeah, I went to school and this is what I can do. Uh, and also for their socialization processes, they did not though express that they thought that these children were learning much in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, what they were achieving in school, which is, uh, you know, it, it should be a cause for huge concern. Um, what our observational data also show is that it highlights disproportionate exclusion of children who are perceived as low performers. And what we mean by this is that many of the interactions that we've uh, observed um, is marked by with with this kind with this group of people uh, people that students that teachers feel are low performers and there may very well be an overlap with their actual learning outcomes as well if objectively as objectively measured is that there it, the interaction with this group is marked with more negativity and frustration and um, you know immediately it becomes comes to mind that it may be interesting to see if teachers had alternative strategies in place uh, or as part of their training, um, then, then could, could we begin to shift the nature of some of these interactions. Um, our observational data also highlight that many of the strategies that teacher used for other children, such as giving individual attention or monitoring, were not commonly observed for this group of children. Um, and this is just an excerpt So this is just an excerpt from one of the observations. So both both the first this screen and the next screen uh, show excerpts from classroom observations for the same class, but two different observations. So uh, the a group of uh, children that you hear or are going to read about being talked about in these observations are the same. Um, and so the first one talks about how uh, the teacher faced. Uh, 
the front of the class a lot more. Most of the activities were also done with students that were sitting at the front of the class. They did not necessarily make an effort to address or engage a group of five or six students that looked quite disengaged. And the observer notes more than once that almost all the interaction that was happening during this period in particular was happening with children seated at the front of the class. Now what you see in the second observation for the same class um, is again they observe there's a group of children sitting in the back that are sort of being left on their own that are not being engaged with. Uh, but then the teacher does ask this group of students to stand up and try to explain a concept um, that the teacher has covered in class. These students are not able to explain this. They keep standing. The whole class is looking at them. And the teacher, in sort of a strict kind of negative manner, explains to them in a bit of a frustrated fashion, again explains to them what the context is or what the concept, sorry, is, um, and then asks them to sit down. And this whole interaction takes about four to five minutes. And after uh, the class is over, the teacher does explain to the interviewer that, look, I know who can study and who can't study. I can pick out the students who are not paying attention. And these are the poor students who are sitting at the back who are looking kind of confused or not engaged may not have understood the concept but when they do get some attention from the teacher it's negative and it's sort of this uh it's tinged with this frustration um uh which is perhaps sort of shifting or or the blame if i was to and this is my interpretation of course but it's shifting the blame of not being able to learn to the student right um and again it's mostly just teacher directed sort of lecturing that was happening this is a different excerpt uh, about, uh, from, from a different class. Um, and this uh, talks about a low attaining boy. Um, and yeah, it talks about a low attaining boy. And the observer um, notices and observes that this boy is trying to approach the teacher as if he wants to show the teacher what he's written in his notebook with his classwork. But when he gets close, because there are quite a few students who are already there, he sort of turns around and comes back. And what the observer does is, uh, you know, speaks to the boy, takes his notebook from him and tries to sort of sift through, uh, sift through the notebook. And one of the things that he discovers is not only is most likely today's classwork that he observed the boy turning around and going back is not going to be checked. But much of the previous class works, there was no marks, there was no uh, corrective marks on this boy's notebook, even for the previous work that had happened. Um, so quite likely, this boy's notebook is not getting checked in class, and the teacher is not able to sort of pay attention, right? Um, and so, so one of the things we began to pay attention to um, and look for is uh, the ways in which, so the different ways in which, while there's teaching happening, while there's activity also happening, there are certain students who are sitting in the same classroom who may deserve attention more that are simply falling through the cracks, right? Um, and this is a low attaining boy. And um, just to sort of, uh, you know, talk about some conclusions before we get to the conclusions, the idea is not to put the blame on teachers uh, uh, necessarily, but the idea is to perhaps underscore that there is more teaching support required within these classrooms, which is prevalent and, and, and a strategy that is used by countries in the global north, um, less so in resource constrained uh, countries in the south, uh, but this is not an unheard of strategy that you don't necessarily have only one single adult, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, responding to and, and, and engaging with all the children in one classroom. You can have teacher supports, teacher trainers, uh, trainees present as well, and you can have uh, other kinds of support staff present within the same class as well. Um, here's another excerpt. Uh, the teacher never notices three, uh, C3 throughout the whole lesson. The C3 looks tense, confused. Now C3 is a low attaining, is a low attaining student that we were specifically observing. Looks tensed, confused, sometimes trying to hide uh, behind the students that were sitting in front. Uh, there were all the signs that he was not understanding anything, um, but was trying to understand from his peers as well. Uh, uh, and, and again, another boy, uh, the teacher seems to just miss when he's present amongst a larger group of students to try to get the teacher's attention. Um, so I think it becomes very important if I was to focus on general patterns um, that 
focusing on children's experience and children's engagement uh, in classrooms. And this has methodological implications and perhaps we could discuss those during a q and A if, if, if people are interested in hearing more about that. Um, children's experience and children's engagement is very important to collect information on because we might be focusing entirely on the teacher, but what's more important to try and understand is the interactions between the teachers and the students. And in this particular study, of course, we were focused uh, on children who may be uh, from marginalized backgrounds, but also struggling the most uh, with learning. But the general patterns that are emerging from our study speak to uh, the fact that children seated in front of the class interacted more with the teachers, had their work checked more often, but it is not always clear if the children who are seated in front are the ones who need more attention. So in the boys' schools that we went to, the low attaining boys were more likely to be seated at the back. In the girls' uh, schools, though, um, uh, there was it, it, it was equally likely. In some schools, low attaining girls were at the back. In other schools, they were at the front, but there was no... There was no clear sort of correlation. Uh, the low attaining children are more likely to be overlooked during teachers uh, interactions and there's a higher frequency of positive interactions with high attaining students. Right. This brings us to the next sort of uh, set of information. So, so far I've spoken about teacher practices and what we learned about what practices look like in the classrooms that we went into to talk to you a little bit about teachers' beliefs regarding disadvantage. Uh, our work uh, found uh, uh, a lot of resonance with what we were finding uh, from a large corpus of work now accumulating in South Asia is that teachers tend to use different practices with different children. And it's usually children who are from uh, who have markers of marginalization associated with their identity that tend to have, you know, get the short end of the stick, which is to say have uh, poor interactions with students, have more uh, with teachers, have more negative interactions or be completely ignored altogether, even during their day in school. And what this corpus of work is telling us and what, you know, in interactions with our colleagues, not just in Pakistan, but abroad, these practices tend to be rooted in teachers' beliefs about difference and disadvantage, right? And I'm going to come to, so with my co-author, Anuradha Dey, we've tried to combine these insights from our own empirical work in, this, in, in these schools in Pakistan, but also the literature around South Asia to try to link teachers' beliefs with learning. And we showed two pathways, and I'll just come to that. So that, that's a couple of a few slides away. I'll, I'll sort of talk through the two pathways, but just to give you a preview, what we, what we think that teachers' expectations from students, or in other words, their beliefs about how smart or whether a student is good or bad um, uh, regarding how much they can learn can impact learning of the actual learning of students, and we'll talk through the pathways, and the level of effort that teachers uh, through their practice invest in helping students is also different uh, for different kinds of kids, and this can this can also impact the learning um, the learning of, of uh, students. Um, so this is just a stylized diagram to try to show. Um, the different factors that we think are linked with what we end up observing. So the practice and effort that we are able to observe in classrooms using our classroom observation tools, and they can be quantitative or qualitative, um, are underpinned by less tangible factors. So uh, your education as a, your own education as a teacher, but also your own pre-qualifications that you have to attain to get to uh, you know, the teaching certificate that you need to start teaching, of course, most importantly, impacts the knowledge that you have about teaching, about pedagogy, and that goes into sort of determining your practice and effort, uh, but also your beliefs to some degree. So what you're learning and what you're being taught about who can learn, who can't learn, how pedagogy works, how students learn, et cetera, will impact obviously your beliefs that you have as a teacher about how what the learning process is and how that happens. Uh, but also who you are. So the sociocultural context. So teachers are all individuals like us who are embedded in a sociocultural reality and their identity. So the socioeconomic status that they have, they belong to, uh, the ethnicity, their gender, their location, but also the culture that they're a part of. Um, and I should probably put down organizational culture here as well. 
sort of feeds into uh, their beliefs about uh, practice as well, uh, right? Um, capacity building that happens on the job, the kind of support that provided to the kinds of trainings and coaching uh, that they get exposed to obviously impacts beliefs. Um, external accountability. So what you're expected to pay attention to. Uh, so if you're only uh, uh, sort of judged on, you may be judged on nothing. You, you're, you're, uh, so your uh, progression on the career path may be happening based simply on seniority, how long you can stick around and every year there's an automatic progression. Devaji, have I crossed the time limit? Uh, Rabir ji, it's perfectly all right. You can take five more minutes. Thank you. I'll, I'll try and hurry up. Uh, but so it may be that your you have no link. So your practice is not linked to any kind of uh, performance related accountability mechanism. But if it is, it, it may be that that accountability mechanism is asking you to focus on the average child or whether, you know, if the top children just improve, then that's fine. But your accountability mechanism can also either your accountability mechanism or your feedback mechanism or some incentive, which is not high stakes necessarily linked to making you focus on the children who are at the bottom of the learning curve, right? That will impact who you pay attention to in class and how much who you actually engage with. Uh, so just to quickly go through some data on do teachers have expectations higher expectations of some students. And in our data and interviews, it very clearly, very strongly comes to that good students are the ones who are naturally intelligent, who are well-behaved, who all do their homework and show up, who are very confident, who are punctual and attend regularly. Now, immediately you can see that these are all students who come from, these are more likely to be students who come from very stable backgrounds, better socioeconomic backgrounds, who have a lot of support at home already. But you children who are more likely to be absent in frequent, have very disturbed uh, home backgrounds, have nobody to help at home, may not uh, display some of these uh, characteristics, right? And then in our surveys also, a vast majority of teachers say that children whose parents are illiterate are unable to learn in school. Right, so it's almost as if they've already determined their belief that you can not study. And many times, when teachers talk about it, they come in front of it. You know, that um, oh, these are kids whose parents are not interested, so that, you know, we can't really do much for them. And the second largest category that they speak about is children with disabilities. Just very quickly to come to those two pathways that I spoke about earlier, the way we think, and this is a theorization. We need to go back. This is a work in progress. We need to go back into the field to maybe collect more data. This framing we've built, as I said, from our own work, but also a the theoretical work by economists, education economists, as well as sociologists in the global north and the global south. And we sort of whittled down their work to put together this framework. And what we're trying to say is teachers' beliefs may be linked to learning it through two channels. If you have low expectations of how they learn, um, uh, if, you, you're, if you have high expectations for good students and low expectations for poor students, those get internalized by students. And there is empirical work from other countries, not necessarily Pakistan, but from other countries that shows this happen, which happens, which impacts student effort, which impacts their learning. So a, a, a poor student may put in actually low effort at the end of the day and lowering their learning. The other thing is that um, you, as a teacher, the effort that you put through practice may be high for good students and maybe low for what you uh, think are poor students. And some of the empirical work we showed earlier sort of indicates that this may be the case in our government classrooms as well, which means that the support received by the student is lower um, and may not help them achieve their learning goals, right? Um, so as I said, this is a work in progress. It'll be fantastic to hear your comments uh, about this from your own experience as well. But the big takeaways for us, at least so far from our work, is that if we want to achieve learning for all, we're going to have to pay both in terms of research as well as policy an explicit, sustained, and disproportionate focus on the learning and experience of children who are from marginalized background, who are at the bottom of the learning learning curve. And teaching practice is the most strategic and significant place to engage with. And while there might be a lot of work happening on supporting teachers, as it absolutely should, we have to look at the content of that to examine it from an inclusive lens to see, uh, is it general? Is it about the average kid? Or is it actually talking about the experiences of the children at the bottom of the learning curve? And what strategies can we uh, uh, sort of help our teachers recognize or provide to them um, that, that, that they can try 
try out in these classrooms and then get back to us about whether that works or doesn't work. And um, improving teaching practices, lastly, requires an engagement with teachers' beliefs about a range of factors. So I'll just stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rabia Ramalek, for this excellent, amazing presentation on a very interesting and very relevant topic. Um, and I will open the floor for um, questions. Uh, you are welcome to raise your hand and then you can ask your question yourself or you can put it in the chat. So while you put your questions together, Rabia Jay, I have an, uh, uh, two or three questions. I was just wondering uh, regarding the survey, so where uh, I know this is not a part of this uh, your your um, presentation today, but could you guide our students or talk a little bit about where you got? Is there a framework? Is it where did the survey come up, uh, came from, and how did you go about in uh, sort of developing this? And another question again related to the methodology because yours is so very interesting. So these interviews with the teachers were taken after a class was conducted. So uh, so the uh, over to you. So you can sort of talk about your methodology because it's so interesting. Thank you so much. So those are those are good and important questions. So uh, when we were, uh, so where the survey came about, we uh, developed at the quantitative measures. We looked for other surveys that had been uh, implemented in very similar contexts, so including Young Lives, uh, but also uh, some of the other surveys on teaching practice in contexts very similar to ours. So in South Asia or other countries that may be uh, comparable in income levels uh, to see and then adapted some of those questions on teacher practice and beliefs for Pakistan's uh, for Pakistan's context. So um, the sections in our survey questionnaires on um, attitudes and beliefs in, uh, in particular um, engaged with the methodology uh, with uh, of some of the studies that had come before us. And we were necessarily interested in looking at questions that had been validated. Um, and so we engaged in conversations with these scholars to figure out and go, go over sort of the list uh, of questions to understand what could apply in Pakistan's context and what couldn't and what we had to think about that was different. And then we deployed those. Um, the most important, I think, part of uh, uh, our methodology that I'd like to speak about is the classroom observation tools, which were qualitative in nature, which is different from, say, the stallings uh, that is usually a stalling, which is which is a snapshot, which captures snapshots, uh, and it's a quantitative measure of, of practices, um, uh, and a, a class which is, you know, which can be semi, it's also a Likert scale uh, sort of thing, and the one being used in uh, Punjab as well is a Likert, high interpretive, uh, highly interpretive in the moment of observation, a qualitative, a quantitative tool. But what uh, we were interested in, because it was a small study, and to some degree was trying to also develop some of these methods on observation and really pull out the mechanisms and interactions, we used a narrative-based approach. And this observation tool was developed by Dr. Nidhi Singhal, whom I believe has also spoken to you uh, this term. Uh, she works a lot on inclusive education and was very interested. So that knowledge base informed her uh, sort of development of the tool, which uh, takes insights from class. So the sections, uh, 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 the categories, the thematic categories that are important to observe in classrooms, we took from class um, and then, but converted that into a qualitative uh, observation um, uh, uh, sort of tool, which ended up giving us very, very, very rich data on interactions between students and teachers. Now we fully understand that there are limitations to taking such a tool to scale, and we're not saying that that should, you know, that all uh, observation at scale should be happening using qualitative tools. What we're saying is actually the insights from such tools, which show you that kids may still be falling through the cracks, need to somehow be incorporated in the tools that are being used in scale so that more focus can be put on the interactions between teachers and students. I hope that answers yes, your questions. And yes, yeah, thank you so much. So we have two questions over here. One is from Usman Jekha, and uh, maybe Usman would like to put his question himself. Usman, would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, 
actually uh, i wanted to know that um, uh, these teaching strategies can be effective for um, catering the students who are struggling in the classroom in the learning but what about uh, catering those students whose weakness is due to the out of school factors uh, how can these strategies be helpful in this in that regard so if I understand correctly, Usman, and please correct me, is that you're wondering if a child can't even get to school, how do we, or spends the majority of the school year out of school, then how do we think about helping them? No, uh, actually, I, I'm uh, talking about that uh, there are multiple factors playing uh, their role in uh, students being struggling in their learning. Some of the factors like socioeconomic status or something happening at their home is affecting their learning as well. So how that will be catered through the teaching strategies? Right, right. So th that's a that's a big question and a really, really important question. And to some degree, uh, I think we're a little bit far away uh, from actually uh, getting to a point where we can start supporting children in our government schools in particular in a very holistic fashion, which actually takes into account uh, their out of school factors. There's a lot that our teachers, by the way, and school leaders in government schools do for kids that are from some of the poorest sections. So we hear about, you know, them organizing breakfast for kids that they know may not have been able to have a meal before coming to school. Uh, they, they, uh, in a lot of interviews and field work that we've done, teachers also dive into their pockets, you know, to make uh, resources such as shoes and uniforms available for these kids. So there's a lot of empathy present in um, uh, the government uh, um, sector employees that we have working in our government school. But to address your questions in particular, there are two strategies or two different kinds of programs uh, or almost sort of areas of research that are now gaining a lot of importance as we're thinking about learning, but also diversity within classrooms. One of them is focusing on socio-emotional skills of children, which takes into account the kinds of positive investments that are required to make kids confident, problem solvers. So uh, apart from foundational literacy and numeracy, which I'll just come to, that there's alternative methods that are being thought about how to, how to uh, help the children who may be uh, flagging behind but when you start thinking about socio-emotional learning, and if you put that at the center of, or as, as the central goal that you want to achieve this one child to be able, so your goal may be ye math kar le, or ye padna likhna seek jai, teen, teen sentences pad sake, ek paragraph pad sake, ek jumla lik sake. Ye bhi aapka goal ho sakta hai, aur aapka goal ye bhi ho sakta hai ke this child should be the most confident representation of who he is, despite whatever his circumstances may be, that he be able to engage with a life's uh, uh, sort of uh, situations in a way that they actively problem solve, that they apply their knowledge, uh, that they think creatively, that they speak well in whichever language, right? Um, so that can be your goal as well. And of course, the second one is a very lofty goal, but there are frameworks that are now becoming available, which allow you to break that goal down and say, what do you mean when you say a confident child? What do you mean when you say a creative child? What do you mean when you say a problem solving? child right and then once you understand and break down those non-cognitive uh, non-foundational literacy and numeracy goals you begin to think about what's important and the kinds of inputs you need to provide and those end up, that holistic approach I think will end up being even more empathetic to thinking about what happens so you might want to think about providing support in schools that are psychological that is psychological support and uh, surely we have enough people uh, in our population that can be trained to become the people with skills to provide support even though functioning at scale is very important secondly on foundational literacy and numeracy uh, uh, some of you may have heard about what is called the tall approach teaching at the right level which says forget about grades you assess the child, you figure out where they stand on the day they come to school. And of course you need to keep them in school, but if they're falling behind, even if they're in fourth grade, they can't do what is what they should be have been able to do in second grade for at least some part of the school day, you sit and teach them what is an accelerated, very focused model just for those kids. So you might have kids from fourth grade, second grade, first grade, or well, not first grade, but second grade, third grade, fourth grade sitting together um, based on what they can and can't do. And what in rigor empirical uh, evaluations of such an approach has shown is that works that works for helping children who are lagging behind catch up and you can do this in schools it doesn't have to be outside schools i'll stop here thank you so much Rabiati.
Uh, I have a question from Vajya. Uh, Vajya, uh, could you please ask a question? And then uh, uh, Yakub and then Shazia. Ji, in that order. Vajya ji. Great. Thank you, Dr. Taiba. Thank you so much, Rabia, for an excellent presentation. It was really a pleasure listening to you. So I wanted to ask, what are some ways, based on your research so far, that teachers can be motivated to actively redress the learning gaps of low-performing students? Because as you've indicated, for instance, there is something going on in their teacher training already, due to which they practice integration, for instance, with disabled students. So keeping that in mind and all the various types of low-performing students you've identified, what Ways, what are ways the government can perhaps improve the situation within the pre-existing constraints? Thank you. Thank you so much, Vidiha. That's a very good question. So I think we're going to need to experiment a little bit. We're going to need to experiment with different types of incentives. We also can't, uh, and, and you know, really effective large scale NGOs are also struggling with these questions. So it's not that uh, it's not, so th th these are questions that we generally for Pakistan's context need to develop, um, uh, uh, need to come up with solutions for. Um, what's important, so you can think about incentives. There's two or three different avenues that I can talk about. We can think about incentives because incentives in some ways work most, right? So the teachers are going to pay attention to what allows them to progress up a ladder. Um, and so Chile, for example, has experimented, I think if I'm not getting this wrong, but uh, my, I, I believe that Chile has experimented with incentives where you can achieve seniority while remaining a primary school teacher your whole life. You don't have to progress to a university to be recognized as somebody who has stature and who has a position. What that has allowed is teachers to be very comfortable staying in the schools that they're in and improving their practice and figuring out sort of different mechanisms of doing things. So whatever allows teachers to progress up their professional ladder, but allows them to then focus as well. So if you say that, look, you're going to get a bonus, or, and we can debate about the effectiveness of bonuses, but you can get, as an example, you're going to get a bonus if the kids who learn the most, the delta, the move in learning for the kids, the four or five kids at the bottom of your class is the highest. Right, so you might begin to see teachers focusing on that, uh, but we that we have seen that those kinds of mechanisms then you know are not, that's not intrinsic motivation. That's 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 a different kind of motivation. And so what you might then want is some sort of mission driven. Um, uh, 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 intervention uh, that allows them to pay more attention to, to children. So a culture of inclusivity. Um, and the kinds of interventions that might help is uh, sort of peer networks uh, there. But evidence does not exist yet for whether any of these work or how they might work or how you might operationalize them. So I think an important area of work is actually thinking about uh, exactly the kind of question you asked, like, how do we do it? We have some strategies that have worked in some places and not others, but we have to test them out in our context. I'll stop. Thank you so much. I think Dr. Shazia Ewan's question came in first. So uh, Shazia, uh, would you like to go ahead, please. Yakub, I'll come back to you. Ji. Thank you, Dr. Tameem. Um, uh, interesting topic, Dr. Malik. Thank you very much. Um, I was thinking about it's a purely methodological stage question about observations. I found that observations are very tricky in terms of how you prepare the observee uh, and, and, and also the students as, um, as well. So I was thinking uh, one part of the question is, did in any way your observers uh, report uh, um, that the authenticity of the practice or lack thereof was not as um, convincing during observation. So were they able to kind of sift the information from, uh, from authentic to um, staged, so to speak? Um, and if not, um, how, did you, how did you prepare your teachers in these schools that uh, this is how you're going to be observed, these are the points, were there any uh, points or stages that were accomplished b before uh, the observation started. And how did your uh, partners in India do it? So if you could just briefly, and then I, um, I'm going to let Yagub ask his question. 
Thank you very much. So uh, the Hawthorne effect wasn't it wasn't really so that may be seen as a limitation of this work. Uh, so we asked, uh, uh, so we weren't testing whether or not, uh, you know, remaining in class for a very long time, then allowed uh, their practices to return to some kind of a normal mean. I know Tahir and Rabi and Christina Brown have done that work for quantitative observations in uh, private schools uh, that they've done for the Beacon House uh, school because that was important for their study. Um, we hadn't shared while we asked for permissions and all teachers had uh, uh, the option to opt out of being observed as well. They did not know necessarily, they knew generally and broadly that we were going to come and observe their classroom, what the project was about and that it was focused on children um, uh, from uh, marginalized backgrounds sitting in these classrooms and their practice and their beliefs, uh, uh, etc. So the description of the project was all shared with them but the classroom observation tools had not been shared with them. They did have the option to back out um, at any point, although none of the teachers did. And the permissions were sought all the way from the pro provincial district to then school level uh, in order to go in. They also knew that we were not from the government so that this study was absolutely in no way connected with their professional uh, evaluations, that the head teachers weren't doing these evaluations, that they weren't uh, feeding into their ACRs or anything like that. Um, we absolutely are aware that so, so the extent to which you see negative practices may be much, much fewer. Uh, so we may have picked up much, much fewer negative practices and maybe, you know, some over observation of, say, positive practices. Um, but the fact that we still have picked up negative practices. Um, so this is an exploratory study. It's a qualitative a mixed method study with the qualitative observations. Um, and absolutely, that limitation may be in place. But what's quite Quite um, uh, interesting for us is that we're still able to uh, capture a variety of uh, uh, practices and a lot of nuance in uh, also describing why they're choosing certain strategies and how they're choosing certain strategies. And our sense from interviews also is that whatever beliefs they may have, they're quite candid about it. So if they do believe that children of, of children uh, of parents who are illiterate cannot learn. They're explicitly answering that uh, to be to be the case. Um, so uh, I hope that answers your question. It does. I actually picked a few pointers as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. And just one point. So the team in India did it exactly the same. So our methodologies were similar. OK, thank you. Thank you, Rabia uh, Ji. Uh, can I jump uh, Hi, Dr. Rabia and Dr. Tayeba. Uh, Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to join this talk. As a, as a former student here, it is it is doubly pleasure for, for me to, to be able to join this talk. Uh, so Dr. Rabia, my question is around the discourse on these uh, young versus uh, more aged teachers, right? Uh, so generally it is believed that the younger teachers are better qualified, better trained, uh, that they, they have more energy than probably the, the older ones. Ergo, they should be uh, able to teach students better. So we just finished some, some field work in KP and what we are seeing is, yes, the younger ones are better trained and they have uh, better degrees, but they're also applying at the same time for, for different uh, you know, positions, both in the government as well as in, in, the, in, the, in the private sector. So this teaching job they're currently on is kind of a temporary thing for them. And what we are seeing is that their incentives do not necessarily align with, with uh, that, those of the uh, SEDs or, or the schools. So it doesn't really hold up that uh, these younger teachers will necessarily deliver better or teach better. I was wondering what your observation was. Uh, if, if, if you had any, if you have any insights on uh, whether, whether or not the, the younger ones were doing really good in terms of teaching, whether or not they were more attentive and more uh, accommodating of, of children with different needs. 
Thank you very much, Yaku. Very good to be connected with you again. And this is very, uh, this is incredibly important and a good learning for me as well, what you're finding uh, now it, 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 on ground in KP about how teachers are thinking about this, which means that I think it becomes even more important to try and engage with what motivates teachers and what's uh, how they're thinking about this. If government school jobs, it seemed to me used to be these high value uh, end goals that a lot of that a lot of teachers have. Um, it, it, you used to see a lot of turnover and 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 this intent to move quite quickly in in the low fee private sector and not necessarily the government sector. So that's very very interesting uh, that the new cadre of teachers. Um, I, I I'm now unsure. I know that in Punjab, uh, one disincentive for sticking around for a long time and and paying attention was that uh, Punjab had introduced at one point contract teaching, uh, which meant that if your performance was good, you're going to remain within a system and you're only going to be notified to become permanent after three years of your work and not before that. But then that got thrown out, I think, by the court. And actually, it, it, it's implicit, it's implicit, if not explicit, that uh, all government school teachers, once you have a, a, a position and once you have a, what do you call that? Um, um, you know, if you've been appointed somewhere that you're most likely now part of a system and that you're going to remain there. So it's very, very interesting what you're speaking about. Um, we have to analyze our data and the differences in attitudes and beliefs a lot more. But at the time, what we saw the differences between teachers with experience was that their ability to sort of their beliefs tended to be slightly more different. So the old guard had firmer beliefs about who could do well and who couldn't do well and who for whom they could make a difference based on their teaching and the younger lot was more flexible with with regards to that this is different from their actual practices what it was was you might have a cohort of teachers who are more open to learning about uh to learning about new kinds of practices um we hadn't at that point asked explicitly about how long they were planning to stay in the system or whether they were planning to move away. And there was no intervention that looked at explicitly sort of working with them. Uh, so we didn't we didn't have that. Uh, but we did sort of see this, this kind of difference uh, in terms of attitudes and beliefs. Um, but experience also counts for something in some ways, which is to say that even the younger lot was learning certain kinds of strategies from the older lot. I don't mean this in a negative way. I mean this in a positive way. Also, in the government schools information about how the system works uh, was what they were learning from them uh, in terms of sort of uh, the rules of running a school of being present in a school who, who within a system they had to approach to get things done things like that um, but but I think a more deeper study on attitudes and beliefs is needed uh, it'll be great to see what why they're no longer interested in teaching um, yeah I'll stop there Thank you, Rabia Ji. Um, I don't see any questions over here, but there's just one more question um, uh, since you are here. Um, we are talking about marginalized students um, or, you know, uh, community within classrooms. I just wonder when you approached it, so what did you take into account as, ma as an indicator of marginalization? Was it like caste or uh, was it like class? Or did you look at low performing students and then you try to find out, I mean, how did you approach it in terms of marginalized, identifying marginalized students in the classrooms? Right, right. So Sayuji, the first um, stratification was by, uh, at the district level and their um, sort of, um, and, and Kasur was always a question mark, like does it really count uh, or, or not? But within district, you also had variation. So we looked at even community level sort of data and district level data on development indicators. I forget exactly which one. But then once we were in the household, so we went and did the household survey first and then traced, and a lot of the households were sending their kids to the schools um, within, within the community. And we were focused on the primary schools. So, uh, but we were able to trace uh, a large proportion. So from the household, we had information on their socioeconomic indicators. I believe it was asset-based um, categorizations that we did, uh, but uh, 
so some limitation, but income, you know, you can speak about which measure gives you sort of which, how, how reliable, but I think we went with the asset-based um, categorization and then we're able to trace these students into classroom, in, into schools. And then we selected select kiya tha. Kuch hamare bachche hamare gharon se mil gaye the. Aur kuch bachche wahan pe, the teachers also were not, um, when we spoke to teachers also about uh, the uh, employment of the parents, the education level of the parents, they were actually quite informed for the kids that we didn't have household data on. So in the end, we had almost two rosters, uh, the household roster with the children present that we identified in schools, but then also a, a classroom roster with some information about uh, the backgrounds of these kids. I don't think we asked about caste or religion uh, at that time. We kept it to socioeconomic status. I'll stop. Thank you so much, Rabia Ji. Thank you so much. The questions are coming because the study is so fascinating. Totally um, uh, enjoyed. Thank you for taking our time for us thank, uh, and we look forward to our collaboration with ideas to arrange for more um, uh, talks together. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you very much. Have a very nice evening. Thank you again, Dr. Rabia Malik. For thank you very much. Just a very quick, huge thank you to all of you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Love this.